This is the award-winning Brooklyn College News. Covering New York City and your neighborhood. Violent attack on a teenager caught on cell phone. Parents ask why no one stopped a brutal beatdown. Commuters talk about the MTA fare hike. Acrobats defy gravity in the U.S. Aerial Championship. All that and more, starting now. Welcome to Brooklyn College News. I'm Linda Herrera. And I'm Yusuf Rashid. The recent attack on an Erasmus Hall student by a group of girls raises many questions. Parents, teachers, and community leaders struggle to understand how something like this could happen and how no one stopped the attack. Ashley Schwartz and Mariah Stevens investigate. Here at the McDonald's on Flatbush and Snyder Avenue, we saw police ensuring that teenagers kept it moving. A big change from the day that five girls jumped a classmate inside of the restaurant. Police showed a strong presence after cell phone video caught five girls mercilessly pounding 15-year-old Ariana Taylor. The next day, we found that video on her Facebook timeline. All the students attend Erasmus Hall High School down the block from the restaurant. It could be my child, it could be anybody's child. That's crazy. Parents and neighbors wonder how it could happen. This parent was afraid to show her face on camera. And these kids today is too much. This girl was stabbed by so many people and no one helped her. I am hurt because it was my child. I would have been going to jail because I would have come and I would have taken care of everybody. I don't care because that's not what I sent my child to go to school for doing. Three days after the attack, Police arrested 16-year-old Anaya Ferguson and four others, including a 14-year-old. Police say Ferguson already has a lengthy rap sheet. In separate incidents, she was arrested for assaults on her grandmother and brother. Police suspect the attack was gang-related. Erasmus Hall students we talked with seem to accept the violence as part of their everyday life. It's not, it's not a bad school. It's just like kids fight all the time. I got into fights in my life before or whatever because sometimes I feel like people be coming out their face and talking crazy to me. But a paraprofessional at the school said things may change. It's had a big reverberation amongst the community of the school. There's been a number of talks about it. There's been a number of um, assemblies that spoke to the issue. Get off the reality TV shows and get into reality. Community advocate Tony Herbert urges students to change now. This video has over 300,000 hits and they're celebrating this like this was the best thing and they're championing the fact that she was able to hold her own to say that, wow, you stood up. That's not what we should be talking about. What we should be talking about is how we should stand together. And why didn't anyone break up the fight? Brooklyn College sociology professor Gregory Swin Simon says people hesitate for good reason. To be honest, you don't see a lot of people intervene in an active fight like that because it's dangerous, particularly if there are six people in the middle of the fight. Smith Simon also says it's important to remember that teenagers don't always grasp consequences, and that's biological. In teenagers, the prefrontal cortex, which helps you deal with stressful situations, is still developing. It ends up developing into your mid 20s. Um, and so in a situation like this, teenagers see a stressful situation and they don't know what to do. The young woman who was attacked suffered a concussion and bruising. No one from the Department of Education would talk to us for this report. But my fellow student reporter Ashley Schwartz and I would continue to follow the story. Reporting from Flatbush, I'm Mariah Stevens, Brooklyn College News. We love it when gas prices go down. Recently, motorists in some states paid less than $2 a gallon, but prices began to rise again in February. Monique Jones takes a look at what's in store for the future. Cheaper gas and drivers like the savings. Many find it a big relief. It's very helpful. It puts extra money in my pocket that I can use to feed myself and my family. I save $20 a day, so that's actually $100. That's a, um, a cell phone bill or something like that. Prices went down after crude oil prices went down. Great for the economy, great for business, um, great for the casual driver. Save money. The day we shot at the pump, regular gas cost $2.47 a gallon, $1 lower than last year. New Yorkers pay some of the highest gas prices compared to other states because New York taxes gas at a higher rate. I have kids, I take them to college, they go back and forth, and I'm, I'm here maybe once a week. Gas was lower in January. In some states, it dipped down below $2. Consumer advocates say prices may continue to go up some. An unhappy thought for motorists. My job doesn't really like reimburse me at the end of the day, so... If, um, if they lowered the gas prices, I could actually save a little bit more money. In the meantime, consumer advocates suggest we should think about fuel-efficient cars. Monique Jones, 
Brooklyn College News. IDNYC, the New York City ID card became instantly popular and the city couldn't keep up with the demand. Now there is a wait, but Ashley Schwartz says many still want it. I am a New Yorker. <laughs> Voltaire got lucky. He and others here at the New York Public Library got the chance to jump the waiting list and sign up for IDNYC cards. The library and city officials hosted an event to promote IDNYC. It will be very helpful, especially for the, undo for the undocumented community to say we will be able to get, to get that identification. It also gives New Yorkers access to libraries, museums, and discounts at theaters. There are too many people who feel they can't afford to go to the museums. You sign up for this card yeah. and you can go for free for a year and then we'll see what happens. But since its launch at the end of January, the demand overwhelmed the city. Now you must wait to get an appointment to apply. We got to step it up and, and get more uh, personnel. And we had to tell the mayor he's got to staff up a little bit more. People have to wait until September. And that's a problem for many of the city's 700,000 undocumented residents. They really need the card to open bank accounts and get a financial foothold. I think it's really good. Um, a lot of people would have benefits that they didn't have before. If this is possible, it will be a great, wonderful thing. If you want an ID NYC card, call 311 or visit nyc.gov forward slash IDNYC. Ashley Schwartz, Brooklyn College News. A Brooklyn supermarket transformed the way it looks and the way people shop. The market focuses on healthy food and healthy eating. Courtney Knuckles checked it out. Face painting and popcorn, but there's no cake and candy here. Customers are celebrating healthier foods. Everything looks so fresh and beautiful, very nice. It, it encouraged me to, to cook more. And, and cook healthy. And East Flatbush needs healthy food. Obesity continues to be a problem in the community. 24.5% of residents were obese and 11.8% had diabetes in 2009, according to the Center for the Study of Brooklyn. That's why it's good news of change at Cortelyou Market in East Flatbush. I think they did pretty well and with all this new ex uh, renovation and stuff. Hey, they're going to do great around here. The market spent nearly $1 million to renovate and to showcase healthy fruits and vegetables. I love fruits. Um, I love fresh vegetables. I'm not really a canned person. The addition of the produce section brings in new customers like Jewel. A lot of times I would just pass by or just get off the train and just go home and go like further up to where the other grocery stores were. But since they seem to be improving a little bit more, I'm a little bit more open to shopping here. The owners of the Cortelyou Market served the community for 25 years. They hope to contribute to a healthier East Flatbush in the next 25 years to come. Courtney Knuckles, Brooklyn College News. A Brooklyn chef takes a new twist on an old tradition. And volunteers continue to rebuild homes two and a half years after Hurricane Sandy. Stay with us. President Obama called for an end to silence about campus assaults on women. And here in New York, there's confusion about whether the NYPD or college officials should handle complaints. Melina Skill says the city council wants to play an active role. At a city council hearing, Julia Crane talked for the first time publicly about her sexual assault on the Bonner campus. The consent education I received from Columbia and Bonner was completely insufficient, and many students struggle to understand consent and recognize sexual violence when it happens to them or their peers. Rape on college campuses often goes unreported, according to the U.S. Justice Department. Yet, many question how colleges and police handle cases. The committee hopes to figure out whether the police or the Department of Health should deal with campus sexual assault. We're very concerned about expanding the role of law enforcement in campus sexual violence reporting protocols because we believe that it would deter survivors from reporting or coming forward to seek help. Public advocate Letitia James wants a law giving the health department authority. Survivors, they're not victims, they're survivors who um, do not want to report their, their incidents to uh, the police department, their crimes to the police department. Um, and they really should maintain the power over the incident. But the de Blasio administration wants the NYPD to continue handling the investigations. Deputy NYPD Commissioner Susan Herman said the system works now. If you come to the NYPD, you have experienced investigators who have been trained in how to investigate what Chief Oscar referred to as probably the most complex crime to investigate that there is. But victims who testified said they would prefer the public advocate's plan. Zoe Ridolfi-Starr said she went with a friend to report a rape 
and a police officer brushed them off. He told me that he thought my friend was lying because she couldn't remember the eye color of her rapist. The debate on who should handle sexual assault cases in college campuses continues, but victims should know that they still have the choice to report the crimes to the police or any other agency. Melina Gill, Brooklyn College News. Two and a half years after Superstorm Sandy tore through New York, many neighborhoods still struggle to repair the damage. A group of volunteers from all over the country came to Brooklyn to help rebuild homes one at a time. Volunteers tear down what's left of the old walls. They build new ones smooth, sand, and repaint. We just started on Project Brooklyn in January, and this is our first home. So we're looking forward to getting a lot more work done here in Brooklyn. Kim is one of the volunteers who came to Brooklyn with Massachusetts-based All Hands Volunteers. The group helps rebuild in disaster areas around the world. One thing I think that's really cool is that we accept almost anyone to come and volunteer with us. It's kind of our modus operandi. Anyone who wants to help can help. Um, and if you come and work with us, you have three meals a day and a place to sleep for free. Rico Wilcox from Kansas City, Missouri says he traveled around the country and helped in other rebuilding programs and now he's in charge of the All Hands Brooklyn program. We hope to accomplish to rebuild 15 to 20 homes by the end of August. That's our goal. Stephen Huber from Yonkers also worked on other rebuilding projects before joining All Hands in Brooklyn. I came for three days for the three day stretch so that I can you know, get a break from school and, and also from work and do, uh, do what I can for the community out here in Brooklyn. We watched All Hands work on two houses in Seagate and Canarsie. This house we've been working on for a month already. It'll probably take another month to be fully complete. But rebuilding in Brooklyn isn't as easy as it sounds. Brian Stedman has Brooklyn Resurrection Relief, a joint effort of local organizations and churches. The cases are very complicated and tricky. You know, if it was easy, they wouldn't be two plus years away and still not uh, to have their homes put back to home. A trip through parts of Brooklyn shows boilers still heating housing developments and many buildings in need of repair. Yet, at a recent city council hearing, the focus was on preparation to protect against damage from future storms. There has certainly been progress. Mm -hmm. There remains a great deal of unmet need in Brooklyn. And while volunteers help, HUD says the city isn't spending the money allocated for rebuilding. And as a result, the city may lose billions. We asked Mayor de Blasio about it. We feel very good about the progress we've made in terms of Sandy recovery. Uh, over uh, 1,000 construction starts, over almost 2,500 now reimbursement checks. Uh, you know, we've moved a very aggressive effort, uh, and it is succeeding increasingly with you know, greater and greater speed. So I think given that track record, uh, we're going to be able to resolve any outstanding issues with HUD. I feel you know, very hopeful that any concerns can be addressed well. Homeowners who need the help and money tell us they hope this is true. Tanera Teicher, Brooklyn College News. It's tax time and New York City wants you to know you may qualify for the earned income tax credit. Alyssa Andrews says the city hopes residents will take advantage of the service. A lot of people don't know they qualify for earned income tax credit, and that's why the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs is trying to get the word out. Accountants set up shop in Restoration Plaza, along with Consumer Affairs and the Food Bank of New York City, to provide free help. The service from the other income tax company, if they charge very high, it, and Food Bank was able to provide the service to fill out the income tax for free. Chrisette and others like her got advice on how to apply for earned income tax credit. Political leaders want people to understand that they qualify for it. We know in New York City that one in five New Yorkers is eligible and isn't taking that refund largely because they don't know about it. If you qualify for the earned income tax credit, you can receive a big payout. The check that they get uh, with their refund and their tax credits is often the single biggest one-time payment that they'll get over the course of the year. More than 250,000 New Yorkers qualify and don't know. So if you think that's you, you can check out the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs website. Alyssa Andrews, Brooklyn College News. If you freelance for a company and they don't deduct taxes, watch out. It's likely you'll get a 1099 and the IRS will expect you to pay. Natalie Friedman found out the hard way. What's a 1099? What's a 1099? To find out, I went to the accounting department at Brooklyn College and Professor Jack Lackman explained. When they issue you a 1099 miscellaneous form, that is they consider you as an independent contractor. While you're working, 
they do not consider you to be, quote, as an employee. That means your employer doesn't withhold taxes and you have to pay at the end of the year. It also means the employer doesn't withhold Social Security or other taxes. If you are an independent contractor, your employer does not have to contribute. That's 7.65%, so he saves on it. One benefit for you, you can deduct expenses, including travel expenses and money you spend on supplies. To prepare for the inevitable, you need to save during the year. If you owe the government a little money, if you have any problems, they are, the IRS is very receptive. You write them a nice letter, explain the circumstances, and many times they will just forego any penalties that they may want to charge you. If you need help with your taxes, the IRS can help you. And if you're a student, most colleges will help you for free. Natalie Friedman, Brooklyn College News. The MTA fare hike digs deeper into our pockets, and I found riders pretty upset about it. Overall, I'm upset because I'm not even making enough. The 4% fare hike raised the price of a Metro card by a quarter. Now we pay $2.75 for a ride. I'm not a huge fan of the MTA raising their price. The MTA heard the complaints from the public, but raised the fare anyway. I think it's pretty much uh, brought to us in a surprise. I think it's unfair, and uh, for students like myself, um, Sometimes we're not ready for this type of uh, price increase. I feel uh, bad about it. I don't. I, I think it's too much as it is. Look, we got trash on the floor, <laughs> and they want to raise the price. I mean, they need to clean up better. The MTA says they need the extra money to add more lines and improve service. Well, if they're going to give us clean subway, right, they're going to give us more, like clean the subway and make the subway look more better. Then it's okay. But Robert Kornblum of the New York Strap Hangers campaign says not so fast. Since 2007, New York subway and bus riders have been hit with five fare hikes. Those fare hikes have increased the fare from what it was in 2007 by 35%. That is three times the rate of inflation. Kornblum says the federal government needs to step up and subsidize the cost for riders. And commuter Charles Jackson agrees. I think the federal government needs to seriously subsidize it. Because in, at the end of the day, the people who are using the subway the most are the people who support the city. Good news, though. If you're a regular rider and buy two rides or more, you pay 6% less. Yusuf Rashid, Brooklyn College News. Sports Illustrated swimsuit models give us the inside scoop about their jobs. And vibrant colors brighten up the local art scene. Stay with us. You see a lot about Sports Illustrated swimsuit models, but you rarely hear what they have to say. That changed for us. Dominic Rollins talked with models and their jobs and why they love to do what they do. Stars of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition hit the red carpet at Marquee in Chelsea. We got a chance to meet several women as they talked candidly about their jobs. I'm actually really happy. I just like all of my pictures so much and that they all came out so well and really fun to watch the videos and laugh and remember the ridiculous things that we did while we shot. The models shot all over the country for this year's issue. They'll end their promotional tour in Nashville, Tennessee. Australian model Jessica Gomes tells us her experience. I really got to discover, you know, the different places in the U.S. I got to go to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which I've never been to. Um, I got to see the Yellowstone National Park, which was incredible. Ashley Graham became Sports Illustrated's first plus-size swimsuit model. She thinks it's a good sign for others. Stay strong. Everything in the media is totally airbrushed. It's all fake. It's not reality. The average size American woman is a size 14, and you're looking at her right now. So girls, be inspired because this is what average is. It's not, it's not everything you see in the magazines. Irina, who also appears in the Swimsuit Edition, supports what Ashley represents. I think um, we're sending a right message to including plus size model into the magazine because I don't believe that beautiful women have to be only skinny women. Beautiful women is a woman beautiful inside and outside. Whether thin or a little plus, these women enjoy their work and feel lucky to do it. Reporting from Marquee for the 2015 Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition, I'm Dominique Rollins of Brooklyn College News. Some chefs like to branch out. Some like to stay close to their roots. Mariah Stevens found a Brooklyn chef who borrows from Chinatown tradition for his restaurant. Dragons danced in the snow and drums beat. They blessed Chris Chong's new restaurant and he worked to prepare the food he hopes neighborhood people will love. I'm doing all the cooking, pretty much 100% of it. This is my 
little domain, my small kitchen. So um, everything that I come up with uh, goes from here to here to on the plate. The chef uses his culture as a fun way to promote East Wind Snack Shop. He says it pays tribute to the Chinatown tea houses of the 70s and 80s that disappeared. Well, it's a shame. I miss it. I really miss it. I know there's lots of people that miss it. So here's my little, um, here's my little uh, gesture to kind of uh, be inspired by something like that. The restaurant offers classic Chinese dishes like handmade beef and pork dumplings, pork belly baos, dry aged pot stickers, vegetable spring rolls, and slow cooked meat on rice topped with gravy and vegetables. Eastwind Snack Shop has foods anyone can enjoy. I'm Mariah Stevens, Brooklyn College News. Recently, a popular radio station gave fans a chance at their dream job. Carlos Montañez takes us into the competition. Alex Rodriguez in his 44 games. Alex Rodriguez, a hot topic on sports radio and fair game for these would-be sportscasters in line waiting to get a turn at the mic. Don't worry about the gambling issue. People are doing it anyway. They all showed up at a mall in Menlo Park, New Jersey to audition for WFAN's Fantasy Phenom. You only got two minutes up there, so you got to be quick and you got to hit everything you want to hit in a very short amount of time. So I'm just looking to do that. WFAN uses the contest to promote the station and create buzz. We definitely are looking for people who are still interested in radio and still interested in the same things that we're trying to do. Anyone 18 or older can enter. You move through three rounds and if you win, you get a one-year contract for a weekly show. This is amazing. What the fan is doing, giving people a chance to really just walk up and have a chance to be on the fan. I mean, it's great. Some parents came to listen and watch and found something familiar in the contest. Yeah, it reminds me of the American, a short version of uh, American Idol. The finals will begin in early April. Contestants will face off on Mike Francesa's show. Carlos Montañez, Brooklyn College News. Athletes swirled on hula hoops and danced on silks 20 feet above the stage. Other athletes spun on 14-inch poles. Judges look for artistry, difficulty, execution, and enjoyment factor. The winners from this competition will go on to compete in Hong Kong's tournament in May. New York gives art lovers plenty to enjoy. We have team coverage of two art shows that offer something special. My age comes out in my work, so that's pretty much what keeps it unique you know, compared to everything else that's here. Visual artist Jarrell Gibbs from Baltimore, Maryland, showed his unique brand of Afrocentric art at one of New York's most respected art exhibits. We really can do whatever we put our mind to, whether it's art, you know, whether it's being a businessman, you know, any aspect of it. Artists, collectors, and visitors packed the Riverside Church to celebrate the art, culture, and the history of the African diaspora at the Harlem Fine Arts Show. The event is touted as the world's largest trade show of African art. Jarrell Gibbs takes urban pop culture and mixes it with unusual colors, political commentary, and social awareness. He says that through his work, he hopes to bring a whole new energy to the art world. Vibrant colors, you know, the bold lines, you know, the colors really, people, you know, see that and automatically gravitate towards so. I think just, you know, my age and what I represent and what I, you know, bring to the table kind of stands out. Ceramic artist Woodrow Nash from Akron, Ohio, says the show highlights work that may never get a chance elsewhere. A lot of us uh, artists coming up, we can't afford the, uh, the twenty and $30,000 that it might cost to, to show at those events, or we don't have the gallery representation to bring us. Event organizers say art lovers spent more than $4 million at the show. I'm always enjoying the event. It's so much to look at, it's overwhelming, mm -hmm. but it just it, I feel at peace when I'm here. I feel like I'm home. This is where I belong. But for young Jarrell Gibbs, his weekend at the Harlem Fine Arts Show was more than a business opportunity. You can do whatever you want, but you just got to focus and stay strong and, you know, be true to yourself. And if you missed all the excitement, the Harlem Fine Arts Show runs every year during the month of February. Reporting from West Harlem, Zai Sterling, Brooklyn College News. A woman leaves her child at home to clean someone else's house. This painting and others in the gallery by artist Laura James tell the stories of domestic workers from the Caribbean who work in the United States. Mainly the biggest thing I want to show people who do very important work, who aren't necessarily shown 
in the best light all the time or in, in a way that's not stereotypical. James wants those who see the paintings to see what she sees. These people are not invisible, you know, and that they think, and they're thinking people, they're very smart people. The evening we attended the show, several nannies, including Argentinian nanny Johanna Hassan, came to see the show. Hassan thinks James got it right. To realize that like this painting, where the nanny, I believe, is uh, depicted as a queen, as a person of status, of beauty, as a teacher, a lover, a nurturer. Some nannies work for unfair and abusive employers, and the paintings depict that too. For this nanny, that's important women of color who are working in the homes and are still abused, right? Spoken down to, fired at whim. Stories and observations of the nannies accompany the paintings. The artist's sister, Dr. Sonia James Wilson, collected the nanny stories for this part of the exhibit. So I think what is really special about this exhibit is that in addition to being able to present really beautiful work, there's an opportunity to, um, and I hate the phrase giving people voice because they have voices, but there's a, it, it creates a way in which to share that voice with a larger audience. The show is on display at the Borough of Manhattan Community College. You can find more information on Laura James at laurajamesart.com. This is Aniba Kunmaina Dosamwan, Brooklyn College News. That's it for Brooklyn College News. Thanks for joining us. I'm Linda Herrera. And I'm Yusuf Rashid. See you next time.